Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. That's what, you know, it's like all sorts of things were just, it, you know, I look back now, it's like, wow, he... He, we he got us right at the time when he was getting sort of tired of things, you know. I think he got tired of doing so much heavy lifting, you know. I, I think it, it's reflected kind of in his body of work as the '80s were kind of sputtering out. I think he began to sort of like wonder, you know, like his his musical focus was. Uh, I mean, I don't want to say it started to suffer. I think "Love Sexy" is incredible. I love uh, you it. Know? Yeah. yeah. So that's not what I mean, but I think that. Just, I mean, for him to sack his entire band, basically, and decide to start over is saying it right there. He was. Like, he I, also wanted to challenge himself. He, he always wanted to challenge that's himself. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, for somebody like that, I, I would say, although it, we, it, we, it was a much more expedient process, uh, it took a lot for him to trust people, musically or otherwise. So I, I just, just like now that I... I get to reflect upon these things, you know, in relationship to what happened before. I don't. I didn't have a lot of. I mean, I know Des, you know. I I know Fink. He was, you know. I know these people, but you know, I don't bore them with you know questions about. Well, so how? Uh, you know, I <laughs> how's that well, going to look? Fink Fink uh, hung in there quite a while, longer than the others. Yes, but but uh, it's funny because <laughs> I remember the day that uh, I thought that maybe. Fink was probably about to go home. Uh, we were funking in the in the studio C, uh, and just Miko and Levi and Brent and I. We just somebody started a groove and we just all in there. And I I looked up and I saw Fink reading like a keyboard magazine <laughs> with with his keyboard tech, and it all like you know like either shopping for gear or like oh I've heard about this thing. You know, all this funk is happening, and those dudes are reading, looking at a catalog or something. <laughs> and in Studio C, there's a mirror on on the wall, so that you know, if you're doing choreography, you can see, you can measure your movements, you know, so Prince could see everything, you know, especially with Tony Damon and Kirkman, you know, the dancing and all that, you know, you know like a proper rehearsal studio where you kept, you have to see everything, you know, and hear everything. And Prince saw in the in the mirror. Yeah, I saw him look up and. <laughs> And saw Fink back there. <laughs> and Prince leaned into the mic and said, Fink, why are you still here? <laughs> and I just put my head down. I was like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I just, something in me was like, I guess, you know, we'll get through this tour and I guess we'll see what happens. But, you know. Things had run their course there. Yeah, I mean, he was... Frank was was not in the the Graffiti Bridge movie, so the, even then it was like, okay, well, what's going on, you know? But you know, I, I they were probably mutually sick of each other by then. I don't know. What <laughs> you know? You, you're talk, you talked uh, about Diamonds and Pearls, uh, Michael. But from from that to the Love Symbol album, uh, what changed if anything in the process and the creative part of it? we knew going into the diamonds and pearls tour uh that rosie was going to be leaving so that changed everything you know to me it's like wow and also again prince had given her so much 
the oral space, you know. She was her voice was so distinctive, and that and she was ours, you know. So as bad as I felt, I know he probably really was like his heart probably sank. It's like I've given you the, the I've given you the biggest stage you could possibly have in the world, and now you're going, you know. But Rosie had her own ambitions and you know things she wanted to accomplish in life, and you know Prince was in a very interesting position because it's like you want to give people what they need to survive, but not at your own detriment. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's a funny thing because you can sit you know, on the one hand go, he's holding her back. And it's like, no, you know, the reality of it is that he's, it's a delicate balance and it's hard to negotiate territory like that. It's like, I, yeah, like, I mean, you know, she would tell you herself that they remained friends after that. And he, he, he was always, one of her biggest benefactors. So anybody thinks that it was like a messy rift, it was not. You know, she was just like Prince. You know, I'm I'm not getting any younger. I can't I can't wait forever. You know, and she's watching Carmen Electra's record come out and and Mighty Children, you know, the Child of the Sun, Children of the Sun. I can't remember what it was called. Yeah, I think you know? that's it. And meanwhile, it's like okay, Prince. I you know and. You know, as what I think happened, what I what I remember hearing happen, was basically, you know, I mean, also, <laughs> Benny Medina, uh, uh, we and we had called him backdoor Benny because the first time he met her, I saw him trying to corner her. You know, like I think he came to Paisley, he tried to corner her and start talking. You know, I'm sure he was trying to set things up. Well, you know, well, Warner Brothers is already your home. You why there's no reason you can't just, you know, I can only imagine, <laughs> but. You know, and then we started calling him backdoor Benny. Oh, backdoor Benny! I bet he's I bet he's trying to steal Rosie right now. You know, but uh, Motown offered her mil- offered her a million dollar deal. Hmm. She's supposed to say no. You know, unfortunately, that was the year <laughs> that um, they dropped conversation piece by Stevie Wonder, and so the entire Motown you know label was devoted to pushing that along, you know, she got, you know, she got overlooked. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, all that said, I mean, the symbol album, the love symbol album still turned out really strong. Well, Prince had to turn on the juice. He's like, well, I just missed, uh, you know, I just lost a star player. I got to go back to being Prince, you know? So he <laughs> went back to being Prince. My you name know, is the, Prince. Yeah. Oh, ooh, boy. <laughs> I, I went back and listened to that recently. I'm like, how bold. Too bold. Prince was just <laughs> man. I, it didn't hit. Oh, none of it hit me. I was no, in the bubble. No fear. Yeah. No fear. He's not ashamed to declare it. And you know, I I posted something fairly recently on uh, Facebook about Prince. Uh, I it, after I saw uh, after, actually after I had uh, seen the Diamonds and Pearls video. And when I was listening back and going like, wow, that was incredible. Um, that really what what the world may have uh, interpreted from him as being, you know, arrogance or, you know, uh, some kind of, you know, a- aloof thing that was in him. It's like, really, it's like, you know what? It, it, when you're in touch with with who you are in the kingdom of God, you're not supposed to hide that. He knew who he was. He knew what he was doing. And I really believe in my heart that he was, the whole time he was showing the world what he could do, he was also saying, look what God can do. Look what's possible. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was the feeling, uh, the, the overwhelming feeling uh, I've come to get in touch with, uh, you know, since his demise, is that that was really all he was trying to say. Why should I, you know, put on all this false modesty. Don't you, don't you understand what you are witnessing? You know? And the the irony then was, of course, he made that bold declaration. My name is Prince. And then he went to the symbol name, but, uh, well, yeah. Oh, that's funny. I hadn't even really thought about that. (laughs) Yeah. It was like right after, uh, I suppose. And, and what's even funnier, I'll tell you this, uh, the first part of that record all fell out of Levi Caesar's mouth in front of all of us. Just we were sitting around, just like BSing in a Studio B lounge. We were leaving the studio, but somehow we kind of gangulated in the uh, in the lounge. And Prince walked back in, 
And Levi was like, Prince, you need to have a record called My Name is Prince. <laughs> you know, he said, the beast, you know, he just went on a tangent. He was like, I, and he started mouthing all that. I want to be a lover, party. <laughs> Leave, all that fell out of Levi's head in front of all of us. And we were cracking up. But I noticed out of the corner of my eye, Prince wasn't laughing. He was going, he, he was looking like, you know, and, and basically there's that. And also uh, <laughs> Levi used to walk around the atrium at Paisley. And sometimes he'd stick his face in one of the one of the uh, one of the the women's uh, offices on the ground floor, and he said, "You sexy mother." <laughs> I I know what happened. Prince heard him do it, and was like, mm, "That sounds like a song." <laughs> and all the way up when we worked out the arrangement for "Sexy MF," we didn't really know where it was going until we got to that that that. He said, "Right there, Levi, you say what? <laughs> you sexy." <laughs> <laughs> Levi said, oh, oh, all right, all right. <laughs> so, like, you know, we were never in on it. Prince kept it all kind of in his head, you know, and we just had to figure it out for ourselves more often than not. But he was so observant and sponge-like, all right? I mean. Yeah. I, man, I, I don't need, the, don't get me started on the amount of times he would walk into the studio and me and Sonny would just be, and he just go right to the guitar. What keys is in? What what is what's this? What what are we playing? What's that? Who wrote that? Huh? What, 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 put up a fresh roll of tape. And another one gone. 3121. Me and Sonny were just getting tones for the engineer. And we just kind of do, 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 do. amusing ourselves. I see Prince walking to the airlock, you know, of, of Studio A, and he looks out at us. And then he, I see him say to the engineer, and he comes. He does the cool run, you know, out and grabs the telly like, or the the, the the strat. What's this? What what, what key? <laughs> I looked at Sonny like we just gave him another one. <laughs> when was he that was, actually? Was that actually recorded years before, or when was that? Recorded? No, this was like you know, um, this was around uh, I guess when that thirty one twenty one record was being worked. Oh, on. So mid mid two thousands, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were one, two of the rare ones that came back from the dead. You know that we survived being fired to live another day and come back as studio musicians. And you know, and actually, we played the the Tonight Show with Jay Leno uh, with Prince. We played Dreamer. Um, oh, in that was oh, two thousand nine, yeah. right? That was, that was uh, yeah. So it, you know, we were all sometime after Raven to the Joy. Fantastic. We actually kind of mended our ways then um he was working on baby nose and um I, I what i understand is that uh morris hayes must have said to prince like uh hey man you know the the drum machine's all right but you know what this would sound like if we got bland in on it and prince and i hadn't talked in a while he didn't know how i felt you know and to be perfectly honest i was you know still a little bit salty about the way i you know i was put out of the kingdom you know, but it taught me to go get mine. So, I, uh, you know, I got over it. But uh, so Morris called me and said, hey, man, you know, the man doesn't really know how you feel. So I'm calling, you know, on his behalf. It's like, would you be willing to come out and, you know, maybe couple, cut a couple of songs? And uh, I said, yeah, man. I mean, I was living in the same house I live in now. It was 10 minutes up the road. So, you know, we get past the whole awkward pause and, you know, and all that. You get to work, and it's just like old times. Yeah, it seems like Morris has played the like peacekeeper many times. That's because I think that he is the of us. He's the one who appreciated that that gig more. Because in my understanding of uh, Morris's origin story, he was not really a musician. He kind of just he you know he ended up playing keyboards almost by accident. So he never really, I, I'm not to speak for him, but my understanding is that he never really even expected to have a career in music. So for him to look up and be in Prince's band, he's like, oh, I can go to the house now, man. You can put me in the box. You can say things like that all the time. I'm playing with the man, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he was always more excited and, and, and more thankful. For me, I expected great things for, for, for me and from me. 
you know, I knew I was going to do something in music. I, I mean, a lot of people have that confidence and don't do anything, but you know, I, I, I got, I got a few things I'm going to show you uh, to jog your memory and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy seeing these, Michael. <laughs> I've got uh, the original. Oh, well, you know, and this is the original that has the Paul McCartney yeah. thing that was pulled off. He later. put the veto on that as, yeah, as soon as they tried to clear it, McCartney said, no, 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 not for you lot. <laughs> When, when did you uh, find out that you were going to get kind of get your own spotlight and project of, of that kind? I mean, were you... Oh, that? I yeah. mean, I, I neglected to, to include one bit of information. Nobody knew Tony Mosley could rap until one day we started jamming on uh, Humpty Dance. And he grabbed the mic and started, stop what you're doing. <laughs> and Prince looked up like, you know all that? Yeah, P. <laughs> Nobody had any idea that was in his arsenal. Hmm. So you talking about somebody just <laughs> just having their steps, you know, their, their 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 steps being ordered or numbered by God. He walked right into to a wellspring of opportunity. You know, unwittingly. I mean, I think that he probably always had rap heroes, and T Tony was about it. But I don't I don't know that he saw himself that way because I had done. Uh, I want to say I'd have done a done a. Oh, I had I used to be in mint condition before I joined Prince's band, and we had done a show in town, uh, a co bill with Split Level, which was Tony Damon and Kirk's uh, dancing ensemble, and I'd never seen them do anything else but dance, so I didn't know that Tony, you know, I didn't know he did anything else. So it was as much a shock to me as everybody else. And next thing you know, <laughs> Prince has got up in the studio writing, you know. And uh, so I'm, that's what I'm saying is that it's the the new power generation was really Prince going, look at all these gifts, you know, I'm, I, I have an embarrassment of riches. I, I can use these people, you know, any way that, you know, my mind, it's like anything is possible. You know, the heavy lifting was gone. And I, I and I say I'd say also that um, I said this to somebody else uh, that it seemed to me that whatever that sort of darkness that, that had been lingering for some reason, and even partly through the new tour, like he just was, there was a difference in his outlook and attitude and energy. And, and why not? You come to work every day and Rosie starts singing, you know, Sonny starts playing, you know, it's, it's, I really think that we, we pushed the darkness out. Do you think part of the reason I always looked at it that one of the reasons that he took a left turn around then was because Graffiti Bridge just didn't hit the level that maybe he had hoped it would. So he sort of went back to the woodshed a little bit. Uh, you can say that, but um, really it's uh, only he would know uh, or could uh, qualify that or, or, or tell you the truth about it. To, to, for us, it just seemed like these things were happening out of nowhere. Like, it just, you know, how do you go from being, uh, you know, a, a dancer in Prince's band to being 23, <laughs> you know, full on, you know, like top 10 hit, you know, making that publishing money, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, how do you do that? You know what I mean? It's like, I think it really was Prince, uh, the, all these things are happening simultaneously, just like the universe. Like, there's always... There are things happening at the same time. And I, 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 to me, all it looked like was a perfect storm. He, he had every, everything he needed to, uh, to prove that, that his legacy would not end with the 80s. You know? Well, I felt like he went deeper into the funk than maybe ever before in that early 90s period. You know, when you guys did stuff like that and... Um, when he was well, doing the uh, Torah Torah thing and, uh, you know, the name thing and all that. And you guys were doing so many, like, just one-off shows here and there and spontaneous, mm -hmm. con you know, shows and all that. That's because we were fearless. We were, we, it was like being the, the, uh, the Manchurian candidate. At some shows, it's like, I don't even remember. Um, like, TV, like the White Room show, that was just another day at the office. It's like, we walked in, I 
Oh, are there cameras? I didn't even, I, no nerves. It was like, mm, kill. And I just walk into the drum set. And then I see it, you know, years later, once it pops up on YouTube, it's like, wow, we were airtight. Couldn't nobody touch us, you know? And that was at the height of his most, you know, tumultuous, you know, uh, the height of the tumultuous a- aspect of his battle with Warner Brothers. Right. There's this chaos going on there. Yes. But and this meanwhile, incredible the just... killing it. <laughs> yes. So, uh, I mean, really, I, you know, I knew he would have to change directions after we left, after he got rid of us, because nobody else went through that that ordeal with him. You know, like we really we were the axe he used, you know, <laughs> to chop that tree down. <laughs> he was trying throwing like everything against the wall, too. And I, I have this. Yeah. I just wanted to let people see this. He even put out the CD-ROM of Interactive. Oh, yeah. And yeah. uh, just all kinds of stuff was happening. Well, you know what? Uh, I don't need to tell you that Prince was kind of a, a, a futurist. He was just natural to him. I remember sitting in his office, and, and he says to me, this is probably in 1991 or two. He said, one day, all music is going to be sold all over computers. I said, what's a computer have to do with music? You know, he didn't elaborate. It just he just figured out you're not ready you don't understand and I didn't <laughs> things like that he just dropped these little nuggets out of nowhere and he just he had a way of knowing now while we're on the subject one eight one eight hundred new funk that could have been incredible if he had the proper people around to advise him Prince could always see the future coming he it didn't necessarily mean he knew how to harness it you know. And uh, I think there were a lot of, you know, there was a lot of fumbling around during that 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 period. I agree. Um, but he found his way out and had the last laugh. Uh, I remember the day he found out that uh, History by Michael Jackson, uh, that the um, sound scan counted that as three records, not one, or two records, rather. And I'm sure that's when he set the course for emancipation. Mm-hmm. He said, you mean to tell me he drops one record and gets credit for two? So I knew right then he was going to, you know. Actually, we were listening to Earth Song in his office. Uh, and we were all just kind of in awe. It's like He was like, MJ still got it. He's the outro. You you know how Michael Jackson is. You get to the outro of the song, he's selling it. You can't touch Michael Jackson on, on his outros, <laughs> you know. And we were all like, wow, this is heavy. And Prince was sta- standing at his at his desk, and he was blasting the stereo. And we, like, wow, man, Michael Jackson, man. And I think that was also around the time uh, Prince started receiving these <laughs> anonymous packages from MJJ Productions that had, uh, you know, DVDs and cassette- and video cassettes inside of like old Sly and the Family Stone television appearances and like. Going back to uh, the going back to Indiana, Jackson Five concert, like straight from the reel, like with like the numbers and everything. Like Michael Jackson would just send print stuff, and he'd stop wow. everything, and we'd go to his office. Like what did Michael Jackson said, oh, a uh, portrait of an artist, Sly Stone, you know, Sly Stone, you know, Mike Douglas show, Sly Stone, <laughs> you know, it was crazy. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Um, how, how aware were you at the time, Michael, of uh, that chaos that was going on with Warner Brothers and all that and Prince's reaction? Did you sort of like keep your blinders on and just be about the business or? Hard to. Um, only because <laughs> uh, when you are in the, uh, well, I mean, we were just, not just, but whatever Prince was going through, he was not uh he was he wasn't the type of person who would fake it for your benefit so sometimes we'd come to re- to, to Paisley to rehearse and get called to his office and he'd have to vent about Mo Austin <laughs> you know or whoever he talked to at Warner Brothers that day like you know because we were around him he was always talking about it so we knew what was going on you know and uh so no, it was you couldn't really separate. It's it's 
we all went through that trauma together. Did you, did you get it though? Were you like, I understand. And, uh, not completely, but, uh, you know, all I knew is that, you know, for, for a record executive to be so bold as to say, as to intimate that whatever ideas you got in your head already belong to me, that's, you, you know, you're, <laughs> you're asking for it. Like, that's more or less what Mo Austin said about the gold experience. He, and Prince was like, he said, he said I, I, uh, yeah, he said, I, I, he, I, apparently Mo Austin had seen that Prince was working on a record called the gold experience or like my next record is going to be Prince was like that. He'd tell you what was coming, but it, it was all still here. He hadn't even begun, you know, to physically put it together. He wrote music in his head. Um, and Mo uh, asked about it, and Prince said, I, "I haven't started recording yet. I just have ideas for songs in my head." And he's like, "Well, no matter. You know, it's all ours anyway. Something like that. And, you know." And I believe Prince, t you know, took pause to that. Like, what do you mean exactly? You trying to tell me that you own my thoughts? That I don't have? You know, I mean, I don't need to tell you the rest. That's enough to, you know. <laughs> You imagine saying like something like that to somebody like Prince? He, he, he said Mo was asking for war. So no, none of the other executives at Warner's had spoken to him and dealt with him like that before. I can't say for sure, but I know that this particular con phone call set him on the path. And then, like the following week, <laughs> he comes walking into rehearsal with slave on his face, <laughs> and didn't really get into it, you know. But slowly he began to open up about what was what was happening. And, uh, you know, that led him to be a, be a crusader for, for musicians everywhere, for, for artists who signed the record deals and, you know. Own you know, your masters. Yeah. You know, not only own your masters, but don't sign anything you don't understand. Don't let them put you through duress. Take your time and, and you know, be... Just be careful, you know. So, as it's, much as he was a cautionary tale, he lived long enough to correct some things. It's funny because I just had Peppy Willie on. I don't know if you saw that show recently, and he I was did. talking about, um, you know, when he was with Prince and he was a teenager and he helped him learn some of the biz that he was teaching him things about the business itself. You know, like uh, the the um, BMI or whoever would or somebody saying they were BMI would send uh, letters in the mail asking for like $900 to get you registered when it was really just the cost of a stamp. Uh -huh. And he would teach him stuff like that. You know, that there's so many charlatans associated with the recording business. Yeah. His prince, his, that, the anger he had was righteous. You know, I understood that much. And, you know, now, you know, I had my own <laughs> issues about, you know, uh, uh, whatever business situation we were in with him. But, you know, and I will admit that sometimes my trouble with him overshadowed his trouble, overshadowed his trouble with them. <laughs> so, you know, I was not super empathetic. I'm like, I didn't sign the deal. What do I care? You know, I was a little too young and short sighted to understand that this was a real problem. And that even if I did, was unaware of it, it touched me. It affected me. It affected, uh, you know, my profit margin in, in my chosen, you know, profession like it all everything affects everything else we are not independent you know so what he was doing was not only for himself but it was for everybody mm -hmm. as, a, as a fan at that time a diehard fan it was a really exciting period though you know the glam slam clubs were open and he was doing shows at those and the one in los angeles i was at a lot of those shows yeah. uh one of the most amazing i ever saw in my life was being there at like three in the morning or whatever Stevie Wonder came up on stage, and uh, oh you know, yeah, oh was, man, uh, you, when he did "Maybe Your Baby" with us, yeah, yeah, and Listen, Prince man. is just oh my god. Here's what's so funny: we had been playing "Maybe Your Baby" in the set anyway, uh, and Stevie comes walking up, you know, uh, like somebody got him to, to Prince, and Prince led him to the microphone, I think, or maybe somebody led him all the way there, and Stevie's standing there. And it's for a few seconds, like it's a notable pause. 
And Prince kind of assumed in his head that Prince, that Stevie, maybe he forgets how the song goes. Maybe he forgot how the first line. And Prince leaned over to Stevie and said, uh, it, uh, the first line is, uh, I, I'm feeling uh, they're not a little lonely. And Stevie Wonder leaned back and said, I know my own music. I want to say something first. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I, I didn't, we didn't know. We, I mean, he, they literally said this to each other in their ears. And, you know, and Prince was like, uh, yes, sir. And you see Prince step back. If you ever see the footage, it, it'll come out one day. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that was, uh, we found that so funny, but that was that was incredible. Now, here's what maybe you don't know. While Stevie was up there singing Maybe Your Baby, Herbie Hancock was sitting behind the monitor board <laughs> with the I, monitor engineer. <laughs> I did not know that. It was insanity, man. Just, you know, the, just the... There will never be another artist who can appeal to everybody like that. Like, where he's deep enough that somebody like Herbie Hancock can appreciate your work and but also you know uh the message is universal enough that you know beyonce can get it <laughs> you know and i'm not really saying anything about beyonce i'm just saying she common folk she's a great singer but she ain't no musical genius yeah or eric clapton to d'angelo to you know Same, just... that's what i'm saying it's like the greats can't all agree can't nobody take nothing away from prince you know I was heartbroken when they closed down Glam Slam, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, I went to the, the come uh, listening party there, and I was at the – uh, um, uh, I went to – I saw Ulysses there, that show. Are you independently wealthy? <laughs> it wasn't that expensive when I went. <laughs> like, all right, man. I'm just like, wow, you didn't – man, you didn't miss you – didn't, you didn't let – you didn't leave no, no events, uh, you know, unseen. Well, ever since I saw I saw Prince perform his first West Coast show ever at the Roxy on Sunset in '79, and then from that point on, I saw ninety percent of his like shows in the LA area. How did you manage that? It, I just that's just, what you wanted. It's a passion, man. Uh huh. Okay, yeah. I'm sure you can tell me things, man. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to go off the record. Yeah. Well, I was there when he got booed off the stage at the Stones. I've talked about that before. Oh. Um, so. Yeah. yeah. Bobby Z said they threw boots and food. <laughs> and yeah, and I think maybe maybe some bottles and just whatever. Yeah. He just yeah. he said like the second night was way more vicious. It's like they came like it was part of the show. Like he said that somebody threw this package and it hit the drum riser and it opened, you know, and it was just raw meat. <laughs> <laughs> and they brought stuff to throw. I yeah, I was so mad about it. I was like as mad as I heard Prince was. I think. I'll bet. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I, I actually think and Bobby both have touched on those stories with me before. And I'm like, wow, that I bet that was that probably just made him stronger. <laughs> really, he it did because because he came back just months later mm -hmm. and played the Santa Monica Civic. And he ruled. You know, it was only his crowd, but yeah. controversy was out by then. And yeah. it was like such a different scene and situation. Yeah. And you could tell he wanted to come back and like mm -hmm. reclaim what should have been his. That's right. Uh, and see, and an average, you know, a, a, a an average human would have said, wow, maybe I, they would have started to, to doubt themselves. That was not Prince's nature. It wasn't in his nature. And somebody told me, oh, well, Somebody told me one other thing, but Prince told me uh, one day, he said, after I got my first record deal, um, well, let me start at the top. It's a very short story. He said, he said, you know, I graduated from high school early. And he said, right before uh, I was about to graduate, I think it was the vice principal of, of, of uh, Central High School, called him in his office. And Asked Prince, Prince said, he asked me, why are you in, in such a hurry to, to, to get out of school? You're not going to be nothing. You're not going to, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to be anybody. What, what, what's the rush? Why are you trying to, you, you know what I mean? It's like, it's. Why do people feel the need to do that kind of thing? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, it's, that's the thing is what I'm saying is that that dude didn't know that, that he created a monster. You know, 
just I'm saying it's you have a choice in how you process the information you're given. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. Is that Prince never felt sorry for himself. He never, you know what I mean? It's like you could say what you want, but the bottom line is I'm gonna work till I get what I want. And you don't have anything to do with that. You know, your words have no value here. Or I'm you I'm gonna use your own words against you. You're going to eat those words. He believed in himself. You know, I mean, Sonny, <laughs> Sonny would talk about like, man, we used to go to these house parties over south, and you know, uh, yeah, because Sonny really was Prince's mentor. They met on like the the public transit system uh, when I think Sonny was maybe 15, 16 and Prince was fifteen, or and you know, Prince got on the bus and he had a he was carrying a guitar, or like a guitar case, and Sonny was already on and had a guitar case, and it was just like, hey man, what do you play? You know, like they kind of opened the cases and, you know, it was, that's how they met. And uh, Sonny was like, we go to these, you know, um, house parties over South. And he said, you know, Prince would, would, would tell the girls, like, I'm, I'm going to be a famous musician. You know, I'm going to, you know, well, what do you do? I, I, well, I play guitar. I sing. I play, I play guitar. I play keys. Sing something right now. And Prince would hit that falsetto and the girls would giggle at him, laugh at him. And Sonny be like, man, why'd you do that? <laughs> you know, but I'm saying it's like, it, you know, it, de dejection was all around, you know. And uh, well, um, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. Reeves. It's all right. Well, just in, in, in line with that, when I when I saw the 79 show, I mentioned to you, the brothers in the audience were like shouting and calling him princess for singing that falsetto. They were like berating him you sure it wasn't the the, the 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 gold lamey uh thong he had on Are you sure it wasn't because of well, that and the, and the leg warmers yeah yeah uh, oh. but, but 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 the women were like swooning already yes and that's the thing is that's that's the thing prince taught everybody is like you know what a man thinks about what you wear is irrelevant Men are simple. Men are utilitarian. And men are often not really in touch with their feelings. They're scared to feel them. You know? He, he was so smart. The prince was so smart. I wanted to uh, mention the Undertaker project. Ooh. Yeah. What a session that was. And what do you remember about that? And did you think it was actually going to come out? No, man. I mean, you didn't. You couldn't think about things in those terms because you had no authority in in the situation. So it was pointless to hope and to ask and, hey, what's going to happen with that? Princeton, either he didn't know or he didn't want to tell you, you know. And uh, so you learned to just, I mean, that was seven years of just having my switch was on. I was on output mode. That was it. You know, I couldn't worry about that was not my responsibility to worry about that. And trust me, he kept me busy enough to not have to. So <laughs> I wouldn't, you know, speculate about these things. Did, did you always know, like, what tracks were going to go on what project or sometimes they get moved around? No. As a matter of fact, between Come and the Gold Experience was a complete, nobody knew what was happening. Like, until Come came out, we didn't know which songs were going to be on what album. Like he slowly kind of began to divide them and then write more music to fill out, you know, whatever direction they were going, uh, you know. Uh, so no, uh -uh. it was just a it was just a mass creative endeavor. What about in terms of if it was going to be on a Prince record or Mavis's record or something like that? Sometimes we knew, like when we cut uh, "House in Order" and uh, like "Blood is Thicker Than Time." Uh, you will be moved. We knew those were for for uh, Mavis, and he brought a Wurlitzer into the studio to give it even more of that that staple singer sort of vibe. So he was very, he handled that. That that's where he was really super professional, uh, I think. As a, um, and some may argue uh, that a lot of Prince's records were just him muting his own vocal and putting you know somebody else on it. You know, but with Mavis, it was different. Like, because he identified with the era. He he grew up on the staple singers, and he saw a lot of that, you know, d divisiveness and, and hate and, you know, 
uh, political turmoil and whatnot. So that that was his that he was writing for Mavis. He told his own story, you know, in the process. So it was all very sincere and real, you know. But if you if you look at the words, it's like Prince doesn't get enough credit as a lyricist. I think. I think even Bono said that one time. He said, "You really don't." He doesn't get the credit for being such an outstanding lyricist. And if you just go back to those Mavis Staples songs, it proves that he doesn't have to use any catchphrases or any weird language to get his idea across. That's all straightforward and just solid songwriting, you know? Well, like the music press, I mean, they're dismissive of, you know, his lyrics. They were dismissive of funk in general. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look at like when the first, um, fermentation of 1989 came out on cd they left dmsr off which is my favorite song on the whole record i went you know? to the to the record store looking for it on on cd and it's like what oh man i remember that yeah so it's just crazy how you know the perspectives sometimes that get out there was it on the risky business soundtrack is that where i think it was <laughs> yeah that's no, it there, there's a deep dive right there. Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. Okay, man. Let's let's resurface. <laughs> I, I don't want to say, talk about that. <laughs> I want to say though that Mavis record I thought was strong, and I thought you know it made me question whether the Paisley Park um, enterprise was really promoting some of the records enough because you know I mean after she got out on her own later I mean she had a lot more success than she did back then on Paisley. Well. Again, it's, uh, you know, I mean, some people would look at Paisley Park Records and say it's just this, you know, little subsidiary that's meant to, you know, uh, um, serve Prince's, you know, roster of talent. Or, you know, and I think that's really how Warner Brothers looked at it, probably. Like, like a vanity thing. Yeah, like it's just, you know. And, but in Prince's mind, he's like, this needs to be like James Brown was in the 60s. You know what I mean? It's like, I remember him talking about how he said, like, can you imagine owning your own radio station, pressing plant, and recording studio? <laughs> like James Brown didn't need anybody to to get his music out. He could he press it and put it on the air right there. You know what I mean? It's just like yeah. Prince really he's he was always trying to get back to that model with Warner Brothers. But what's the upside for them? To, to accommodate him in that in that you know venture like yeah they become to get... too corporate especially by then exactly and you know he was always saying like listen every time i bring you guys music you know it takes a year before any of it comes out when i'm writing it is when it's important you know and then they say prince we have 1200 artists on our roster honestly you get about 10 minutes a week <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, I'm not them. I'm Prince. I, you know, why are you not keeping up with me? You know, Michael, can you share with the viewers um, one or two out of all those amazing performances that just stick out in your head as being particularly memorable, or mm -hmm. a couple of your favorites, or or maybe? The, if something funny happened or equipment didn't show up or the power went out or whatever. Oh, you just want some sort of random story that embarrasses two, us all? Well, there's just <laughs> two that are prominent in your head. Oh, wow, man. I, you know, I, I blocked so much out. <laughs> well, hey, if you got that risky business thing out, you can, you know. Yeah, I, but I'm a savant. I can't control it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me think for a second. I, I mean... Really, uh, you know, uh, malfunctions didn't happen often because Prince, you know, I mean, I mean it in the most respectful way, was a tyrant. You didn't want to, you know, you didn't want to go back on your word. If you if you told Prince something, it was, well, it'll be here Friday, Prince. Okay. He'll be waiting for it on Friday. And if you don't deliver, you're going to have a problem. You know, so I always knew to pad, you know, uh, to, to pad my... Uh, my, you know, window. And he'd ask, you know, well, when can it, you know, he's like, I understand things take time. When will you have it? And I'd say, Friday. And he'd say, for sure? 
for sure. And I know that I could get it done by Wednesday, but I wanted that, you know, you had, you learned to kind of just give yourself a little margin because the, the results were not pretty if you didn't deliver. Uh, I mean, that's not really saying, you know, what you're trying to get me to say. Well, or like two or one or two shows where the band was just so on fire or maybe somebody came up and jammed with you guys. It was just incredible. Oh, wow. I mean, but there was so many, the shows were so good. Uh, I mean, I think that. Maybe there's one where you guys played for five hours or something. I don't know, whatever. Well, I mean, I'd say that, that the, the gig at Bagley Warehouse, Bagley's Warehouse was, that was pretty stellar. I mean, people don't understand the surrounding circumstances of that happening. We had just played Wembley, like it was the last show of the tour. And we had a flight going back to the United States at like nine in the morning. Prince decides, <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to pull out all the stops. I'm going to fly the Steels over. I'm going to fly Mavis, you know, we're, and we start rehearsing for this thing like two weeks in advance. Just was like, that the, did that turn to the VH1 special? Is that the one? Or no, that was different. That, this is the one they called, I think they called it the Sacrifice of Victor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's they they booked Bagley's Warehouse. <laughs> the David Bowie's standing around. Tom Jones is standing around. You know, <laughs> it's like, this is insanity. We're kind of, you know, upset at this point. It's like, why can't we end a tour like regular people? It's over. Why can't we just fly home and be done with this? You know? So we end up playing to like, you know, five in the morning. <laughs> you know? And the whole thing, you know, got captured. And, you know, I mean, we worked for it. But, man, that was. Your, your stamina behind the kit must have just gotten just pushed to incredible limits. I was young. I could take it. These days, I mean, it's funny you should say that. I'm, I'm gonna be well. I'm 53. I, I, you know, I, it's I can work up to that level of stamina, but nobody needs it. Nobody. I never worked harder in my whole life than, than when I worked for Prince. As a matter of fact, when I went to work for Maxwell, I was surrounded by some of the people that had been with me at Paisley. Alan Leeds was his uh, his tour manager, and Icky James was Gmo's guitar tech. I brought Magoo out with me and um, and uh, Scotty Baldwin was the front of house. He was actually the one who told Maxwell, hey, you should hire, <laughs> hire Michael. And uh, within the first couple days of rehearsal, uh, each of them at some point in the day went, are you really that bored? I said, what? what are you talking about, man? You're looking like Matt Fink over there when it gets like, funky. Yeah, yeah. It's like, look, you're, <laughs> I, we, we know what, what you're accustomed to. And we know, you know, they knew me. You know, none of those people in Maxwell's band, I didn't know any of those people. Um, and, and the musical director was not happy about me showing up because his friend had been playing the drums before I got there. So, yeah, Daryl Daryl Diaz, <laughs> he just kind of mean mugged me from behind the keyboard. What's up, man? You know, he wasn't happy about it. And, uh, you know, he continued to be kind of cold to me until he found out we have the same birthday. And then, you know, he started Which is when? Us, when is your birthday? Uh, March 14th, 1969, okay. literally. And not only that, his father was also born on March 14th. So after that, we became, you know, we were the best of friends for that whole run. You know, like we, he understood me, I understood him. He was the type of musician that really believed in discipline first. Like anytime the keyboard, uh, the 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 uh, sound guy would ask, "Can I hear the keyboards?" He start playing some Maxwell song. He didn't start playing, you know, his you know his favorite you know repertoire. He played what was required. <clears throat> A lot of musicians, you get tell them to start playing, they'll just riff. They'll just play the first thing that comes to their mind. He didn't think like that. So like, this is a job. I'm going to give you what you're going to be hearing later, so you understand the context. You know. Where where this you know the the context the context of what I'm doing, in what you're doing, so, you know, uh, he and I we we saw things real similarly, like that was a, a turned out to be a real hidden blessing for me to to have a little time in that band and Maxwell was just the nicest guy you had ever, you ever wanted to meet, 
He yeah. was so cool. And did he ask you questions about Prince? Because obviously influenced by Prince. Uh, not a lot of them. Like he was careful not to fan out because it's not like he's nobody. That dude sings. He sings like an angel. Uh, so you know, every once in a while, actually, we, <laughs> me and Alan Leeds and Maxwell and and uh, a woman he was with at the time. Uh, who was Puerto Rican? You know, they talk. They speak in Puerto Rican. We didn't know what they was talking about. But uh, he was like, "What you doing tonight, money?" I said, uh, "I ain't got nothing planned. Like, we gonna see. Uh, <laughs> you seen Blair Witch Project?" I said, "No, I've been wanting to check it out. Man, let's go, let's go." So like, you know, I said, Dan came to the hotel and picked us up. And we all went. We came in like the fire exit of the of the movie theater out in L.A. somewhere. And like we sat next to each other, and, you know, and ah! you know, <laughs> screaming at the Blair Witch Project together, and looking at each other and laughing. He he was real cool, man. He was cool to me. Ah, that's cool. I heard though that sometimes Prince would take like the band out to movies. I don't know if he still did that when you guys were there, but oh yeah, we were in in Europe when um when the Fugitive came out, and he found a place, you know, and bought the theater out. And we all went, and uh, you know, also some stuff like uh. What was it? Um, what was that movie um, that 319 was in and Rapop Go to Zip Up? Oh, uh, the stripper with, movie? Yeah, the stripper movie. We saw that. But uh, that was a, ooh, that was, that was rough. There's like, there's like some, like a rape scene in the middle, in, in, towards the end of that movie that really kind of. Yeah, I was sun- disappointed. I was disappointed in that movie. Man, Sonny cause... walked out and I didn't, I was not too far behind him. He was like, this is some bull, you know. Sonny is liable to just stand up and call it out. Like, you know, like, F this, you know, like, let the whole theater know, like, I'm not cool with this. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkinstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store, for cool merchandise at funkinstuff.net and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven results-oriented professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Wolfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one.